God bless you. Thank you for joining us today. We are Abundant Grace Church. I'm Bishop Ramon Di Maria, the pastor of Abundant Grace Church. I want to welcome you to the service today. The title of our message today is, The Calling of God Perfects Man. I'll be coming from 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 26, which reads as follows. From the King James Version, firstly. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, are called. And God's Word version renders it. Brothers and sisters, consider what you were when God called you to be Christians. Not many of you were wise from a human point of view. You were not in powerful positions or in the upper social class. Now, the writer of this letter is Paul the Apostle. He wrote it from Ephesus around A.D. 55. And the theme of his letter is, Jesus is the foundation of the church, the body of Christ. Now, beloved, in this most important letter, Paul tackles sin problems in the church at Corinth. Church problems are nothing new within the church. Neither is the way to correct them. Personal purity, self-discipline, and love for others are vital to a congregation's success. Now today I will open with verse 23, which reads firstly from the King James Version, But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. Now the Good News Bible renders it, as for us, we proclaim the crucified Christ, a message that is offensive to the Jews and nonsense to the Gentiles. So, the other word speaks of, uh, as for us, what we're dealing with here is that us personally, as for us. So, let me say that because I don't want to go any further without making that point. As for us, because then it relates to the verse before. Remember that. Okay? So, we're going to continue with... See, now, let me say this just to clarify this. That when it says, as for us, that means that us as Christians in the body of Christ. Paul is being specific when he was talking about us he is including himself in with every Christian, okay? That we are one body in Christ. Let me say this. Being a member of the church does not put you in the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. It is a confession of faith, a belief in Jesus Christ as the Messiah, as your Savior and Lord, and repenting from your sin. That's what brings you into the body of Christ. Now, we have a physical body of Christ, which is the body of Christ that we can see. But in order to be the, the real physical body of Christ, you must first be the body of Christ spiritually. And that only comes through repentance and accepting Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord. Okay? So you have the physical body of Christ, and you have the spiritual body of Christ. You cannot be the physical body of Christ unless you are the spiritual body of Christ. Okay? So, there are some people that classify themselves as the body of Christ because they belong to a church. No way. You must first be in the body of Christ spiritually by accepting Christ as your Savior and Lord. So, let us move on. So, what it says, now I'll be quoting from the King James Version. Let me say that. So, where it says, but we, that means we who are Christian preachers, we make Christ crucified the great subject of all we teach and all that we preach. Jesus Christ sent and him crucified is the aim of each and every one of us that preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
There is no other message in Christianity except Jesus Christ and Him crucified, the Lord of all, the Savior of all mankind, risen from the dead on the third day, and ascending into heaven, and is now making intercession for every saint of God. <coughs> so understand that for Paul to come from this point, he had, he had to understand the mindset of those he was ministering to. So whenever I preach, I have to know the mindset, know the culture and the character of those that I am ministering to. The message for the church is different than an evangelical message to those out on the mission field. Those that are in the church that are saved, that those that are saints of God, those are, who are the true body of Christ, need a message to edify them, <coughs> to teach them, to instruct them in how to minister for Christ, how to be strong in Christ. Now, when we are taping this, we are doing both instruction and evangelism. Because this video goes out into the world. So the message has to be <coughs> one of evangelism and one of instruction in the body of Christ. Okay? So it's a twofold message here. Okay? That's why you always hear about heaven and hell. And you'll always hear about growth in the church and how to stand firm and how to repel unbelievers. Okay? Now, Paul knew his audience that the Jews were always seeking miracles. What did they say to Jesus? Show us a miracle and we're going to believe. Show us this, show us that. But then when we deal with the Greeks, they want wisdom. They wanted to learn. Okay? So some seek for a sign, a miracle, and the other ones seek wisdom. They seek the Word of God. They seek that how to grow. They, they want a better understanding. That's why when Paul was on Mars Hill, he taught them, and they said, come back again, okay? because I wanted to hear more. They wanted wisdom because Paul spoke with wisdom. So we keep that in mind. Now, where it deals with Christ crucified, this is very important. See, the word Christ means the anointed one. And it's the same as the Hebrew name Messiah. So you can interchange the Christ, the anointed one, and the Messiah. You can use them interchangeably. Now, if you notice in some of Paul's letters, my beloved, Paul writes in a specific way. He says, in Christ Jesus. In some places, it's Jesus Christ. Why is that? It's because he is saying Messiah, Jesus. The Christ. He is the Messiah. He is the anointed one of God. That's what he is saying. Now, Jesus means, of course, salvation and Savior. So the anointed, the Messiah, the Savior. But see, what happens is, through translations, there are some words, some languages, that there is no match for the word. So, it's like when you go from Jacob then you go to James, say, they're all derivatives of Jesus. See, so in different languages, they have to use different names. You know, so we, we have to understand that, that in translations, not all words translate, like we may say, and it, it takes on different meaning, but the basis of the root word from the Hebrew allows us to, to, to associate this word with it, okay? So this is why the, it's, it's not easy to translate from one language to another. 
because you have to, some things you can't say, like, you, well, you just can't put <coughs> a bunch of words together and think that you're saying the same thing, because you're not. So this is why Paul deals, he'll say, I say, I mean, when it's translated, it's our Savior Jesus Christ. And then it'll, Paul will use the term Christ Jesus. So it, it, it means that Messiah Jesus, or the Savior, the Messiah. It's just transposing the words, okay? So, the emphasis in this expression is on the word crucified. The Jews would make the Messiah, whom they expected no less, an object of glorifying than the apostles. But they spurned the doctrine that he was crucified. Remember what crucifixion stands for. Who were those that were crucified? Criminals. Criminals against the state. The Romans crucified the Jews. But a Roman citizen could not be crucified. He was executed by removing of the head. Okay? That's why Paul, he wasn't crucified, but Peter was. The difference is, Paul was a Roman citizen, although he was a Jew. So he had a different law that he had to abide to than Peter. And the means of, how do you put it, the means of punishment, I mean, the, the means that it was carried out as were, were different for the two, although they, though they were both apostles. One was crucified upside down because he didn't think himself worthy to be crucified like Christ. Mm -hmm. But Paul was beheaded. That's so why when you look at 2 Timothy, he tells you he's ready to go on a chopping block. He's ready to, to die, have his blood spilt out. Okay? Upon the altar of Christ. So, as we go on, this must mean more than that Christ was distinguished for more worth. More than that he died as a martyr. Because if that were were all, no reason could be given why the cross should be made so prominent of the object. It must mean that Christ was crucified for the sins of the people as an atoning sacrifice in the place of sinners. See, we proclaim a crucified Messiah as the only redeemer of the lost people. See, understand that in Jesus' day, for so many years, there were a lot of pe people that Proclaim to be the Messiah. But they did not fulfill the prophecy of the Messiah. But Jesus fulfilled every bit of prophecy concerning the Messiah who was to come. And the people were calling for a Messiah. But they were calling for a, a ruler. One that would rule and deliver them from Roman tyranny. They were looking for something else. But what they were looking for wasn't what God had sent. God sent the Messiah to die, to take upon himself the sins of the whole world. Past, present, and future. Now, where it says as to the Jews, a stumbling block, the word stumbling block properly means anything in the way of something on which somebody might fall. Now, have you ever noticed that, like, sometimes people put barriers up so you can't pass through? That's a stumbling block. Like, when I'm jogging in the morning, Sometimes there's things laying in the way. I have to go around them. I'm talking about like little bikes and scooters and things like that in, in the way. That's a stumbling block. And it is put there, it is left there by children, but not as a definite purpose to have 
somebody fall, but because they just leave it there in the way. But nevertheless, it is still a stumbling block. And it is something in the way. Something that may cause people to fall. It's like during the war, they would set booby traps. They would set a line across, and you walk through the jungle, and you trip, boom, everything blow up, see? Or spears come out and penetrate you. They're, they are stumbling blocks put there deliberately. They're deliberate stumbling blocks mm -hmm. to, to, give, to, to harm you. And in the same way that these stumbling blocks give offense to people. And these stumbling blocks can cause people to fall into sin. And who is the great one that sets up these stumbling blocks? Satan, okay? Yeah. Let me speak to you about the stumbling block mindset. Okay. I'll give you three things. One, a stumbling block for them was that they looked for a magnificent temporal prince to come, the Prince of Peace. But the doctrine that their Messiah was crucified did away with all that. They were looking for a ruler to take over. But when he was crucified on the cross, that took away all their hope. And they regarded it with contempt or scorn. Because said, if Jesus said that he is the Messiah, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest, how could he be crucified on the cross? So the cross was a stumbling block to them. So they couldn't understand, they couldn't grasp the concept. Okay? Because the Messiah had, was elevated to a position of power. And that's what they were looking for. Two, they had the common feelings of all people. The native feelings of pride, self-righteousness, by which they rejected the doctrine of salvation. And the one that would be crucified, that people may be able to enter into heaven. They don't want to accept that that the Messiah would be lowered to the position of a criminal. Okay? And three, they regarded Jesus as one given over by God for an erroneous attempt. And, see, because the Messiah was supposed to deliver. We have to always keep in mind that the Messiah was a deliverer, was a type of Moses. Okay? A deliver, to deliver people out of bondage. But they looked at it from a worldly standpoint, from a physical standpoint, not from a spiritual standpoint. This is the case. If you continue to look at things from a physical standpoint, you will never grow spiritually. They didn't understand the spiritual aspect of the Messiah. The, the, the freedom that people receive, would receive spiritually because salvation is a spiritual thing, not a physical thing. Now, pe people can say, well, I was saved from this accident. I was saved from, from death. That's all physical. And the person can still die and can still go to hell when they die if they, if they never were saved spiritually. Okay? So, it's, it's like when Jesus rose Lazarus from the dead, Lazarus was going to die again. If he didn't believe in Christ, he would have gone to hell like anybody else. So we have to understand that because we get a second lease on life, because we're spared from an accident, we had a heart attack and we're brought back, that doesn't mean that you're not going to go to hell when you die. Amen. Amen. See? Because you have to die again to get to heaven. Unless the rapture takes place. But if you're not saved, you won't be going up. You'll be left behind anyhow. 
But people have this thing that everybody is going to heaven. Everybody. Wrong. Everybody in the church is going to heaven. Wrong. Nobody goes to heaven without Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord. And this is the part I'm talking about, the evangelical part of our preaching on Sunday. It's instruction. An instruction for you to take the same word and to re-relay it to the other people. And because you're saved, that doesn't mean that you're not going to face adversity and tribulation in this life. You're going, you're going to. Yes. But Jesus said, I am with you always, even to the end Amen. of the world. Amen. Okay? We need to preach the correct doctrine to people. No church will save you. No ministry will save you. Mm -hmm. I don't care how much money you give. Without Christ as your Savior and Lord, you go to hell. Period. Period. So, that's why, see, the Jews detested the cross. Because the cross was the sign of a criminal. Of the lowest form of, of death. Okay? So that's why I said he couldn't be the Messiah. When he's on the cross, that's why I said, if you are truly the Messiah, come down from the cross and we'll believe you. If you were to come down from the cross, the whole world would be going to hell right now. Matter of fact, we'd have to live according to the law, which by the law, no flesh shall be justified. Okay? Now let's deal with the Greeks. See, to the Greeks, that means to the Gentile. You're either Jew or you're Gentile. Period. Okay? That's it. There is no other. You're either part of the circumcised or the uncircumcised. Either one. Okay? So, so the, the Syriac and the Vulgate and the Arabic versions all read the term Greek. It denotes all who are not Jews in these translations, okay? Because remember that the King James isn't the, the only translation. They translated from the from the Greek and the Hebrew. They translated into the Vulgate. The Vulgate was the Latin version. Okay? And they translated into the Arabic languages too. So understand that the King James wasn't the only one that you know we had in the, the German language, you know, and uh, Jerome uh, trans tra translated it into the Latin. So we have different translations out there. But the, the big translation uh, came about when they translated the Word of God into the English language because the, English, the, the world that time was growing and the English uh, language was growing and growing and growing especially in the, the New World. That's why the Bible that they had in the New World was the King James Version for years. But I've seen some of the older versions, and Gloria, you have seen it too, and uh, you can't hardly, hardly understand the King James Version and the spelling. So there have there been different updates. That's why they said so year, so year, so year, you know, so many years. And now we have come to the, we have the New King James Version where they remove thee and thy, you know, and you have all different ones. Like, I use the Good News translation. I use the God's Word translation. The International Standard Version. The Contemporary English Version. To help to get the point across, because everybody isn't on the same level. Although they speak the same English language, there are different, different levels. I mean, because everybody isn't educated. You know, they're not on the same level. So they need a simpler version. That's why God, God Speaks Today is a good verb because it is like second grade. And a lot of people can understand it. But you get the King James, it's like high school, you know, for, you know, your fourth year of high school. Well, it's, it's a little higher, it's a higher version. And some words are a little harder to, to understand. Amen. So that's the same with any language. That's why, you know, when Jesus, when, well, when Paul wrote, let me put, put it that way, he translated the words of Jesus, okay, into the 
classical degree, classic Greek, not the higher Greek, because he knew that the people that were reading it were, were slaves of the Roman Empire, say, I mean, things like that, and they didn't understand these, a lot of them couldn't even read, matter of fact, but they could understand, so people could read it to them, and they would understand, but it had to be in, in, at, at the level where people could understand. That's why a lot of people in churches, they, 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 they hear the King James Version, but they don't understand a lot of the words. And then maybe the preacher may uh, use some words in Greek and things like that, and, uh, and the people have, have, have no idea of what the preacher is saying. That's why I give it to you, to you in, in different levels, in different translations, so you have a clear understanding of, of what God is trying to say to you. Not what, what I am saying, but what is God, what God is trying to say to you through me. And it's my responsibility to, to speak to you in a manner that you understand. All of you that are here today and all of you that are watching this video or hearing the audio portion of it. So, we know that it, when Paul talks about to the Greek, he's talking about the Gentile. Okay? So, <coughs> when, when he talks about foolishness, he's talking about folly. And it's like a lot of people have ideas that aren't adaptable to society. And we call that foolishness. Because it's like people think that these things will never work. Why, you know, people are laughing at Thomas Edison too, and Alexander Graham Bell and all of them. But Every one of these inventors, they had more failures than they had successes. So they said they, it was folly. You know, they don't get work. How can you talk? I remember years ago, they were saying that you could uh, talk to people and you, and, and you could see them. Well, wow, that's foolish. How's that going to happen? Look at today. You can speak to people on the phone, you say, on, over the computer. You can see them. You can speak to them, relate to them anywhere in the world. So when people said it was foolish... Well, guess what? It wasn't. We have it today. If someone had a vision, someone had a dream. But remember, them things would not have happened unless God allowed them to happen. Okay? So we give God the glory. Mm -hmm. To understand that the, a lot of the Greeks gave the whole account of Christ as foolishness, also. As, as a fable. Because it didn't meet their level of expectation, wisdom-wise, okay? And it wasn't according to their ways, the way they thought. See, the Greeks were philosophers, <laughs> remember that. They, they had great knowledge, but the simplest things they did not understand, okay? And that's the problem that we have in the church. They want to make things so technical, that people don't understand. They go in and they walk out the same way that they went in, without understanding, okay? That's why you must speak to people in a manner that they will understand, to get the, get the point across, we'll have a full understanding. Because if they don't, they're going to be lost, they're going to be wrapped up in some, and they're going to be weak. If you don't speak correctly to them, and, if that, and, and use words that they'll understand, it's just going to go in one ear after, or as I say, go over their head. And then they're going to be weak. They won't understand. They'll, they'll fall into Satan's tricks. And Satan will twist everything around in their mind. Then they'll be entrapped. They'll be in bondage. And then they won't be able to bear fruit for the kingdom of God. Or bear fruit in any area of their life. Say, and a lot of the Greeks saw no advantage to this doctrine about the Messiah. You see, they would, the Greeks would research, remember, they were seeking wisdom, and they would read the scriptures and things, and, or the, the, by fact, the Old Testament, which was, you know, they would read the prophetic word of God. And they would see, well, here, here is this, this guy is, is supposed to be a saint, and, and here he is, uh, I mean, he's supposed to be the Messiah, this all-holy thing. He was born in this, in this manger with a bunch of animals. 
some cold winter night. It didn't make any sense that a king, because how was a king born? Okay, a king was born in royalty, right? Mm -hmm. So that's why they couldn't comprehend this. Okay, it didn't match up with what they with with their culture and what they were taught. Okay, so they couldn't accept any of this. So they counted it as foolishness. Okay? So, let's move on to verse 24. And it reads, But unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. That's the King James. So, in the contemporary English version, say here's another version that I'm using today, our message is God's power and wisdom for the Jews and the Greeks that he has chosen. That he has chosen. Remember that we are called by God Amen. to be saints. What I want you to do sometime is go through all of Paul's letters and read the opening verses. Okay? It says, Paul, an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, or called to be an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. They read it, it, it has it chosen. Some translations say chosen. Some say elected. It just depends on what translation you're reading. And you'll see that he was called to be an apostle. He was called to be a minister of God. He didn't choose it himself. Christ was the first thing from his mind. Matter of fact, anybody that believed, Paul was saying they're fools. He tried to have them arrested, persecuted them. Remember, he was Saul at the time. Before he got converted, took the Christian name. Saul. Okay, or Paolo. Or uh, Pablo. He was he had a different name. Okay? So, no matter what the translation is. So, if you, if you read the Spanish Bible, it's Pablo. If you read the Italian one, it's Paolo. And of course, there's different renditions of the name, too. So, so here we are. But it says that, but unto them which are called, that means to all true Christians here. It doesn't say members of the church, of a church. This deals with the call, the members of the body of Christ, like I said in the beginning. You can only be a member of the body of Christ if you have been converted spiritually. You can only be a true member. Now, you can have your names on the rolls of a church and be lost and go to hell. There are people that are baptized and are not even saved. Baptism won't get you into heaven. It's only a belief in Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord. It talks about both to the Jews and the Greeks. You know, that, that means whether originally of Jewish or Gentile extraction, they have here a common, similar view of the crucified Messiah. So it says that Christ is the power of God, which means Christ appears to them as the power of God. Or it is through him that the power of salvation is communicated to us. It is through Christ that the power of God is communicated to us. Because God sent his only begotten son. Okay? To die for us. And whoever shall believe in him, they won't perish but have everlasting life. That is a spiritual conversion. Not physical. Okay? And let me say this, that... If Christ is truly your Savior and Lord, you truly accept Christ, a change is going to take place. Yeah. If there's never any change take place, you need to rethink your salvation. Okay? Because somebody says you, you're saved because you said a prayer, forget it. You must confess it with your mouth. You must believe it in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. You must truly repent and turn away from your sin. If you're still living a sinful life, 
you have a problem. You really need to get with God. You really need to seek discipleship. Because you have a problem with your walk with God. And it speaks of, and the wisdom of God, the way in which God instills his wisdom in you through salvation. See, we have to understand that only through Christ can you secure forgiveness for your sins and sanctification. It's only through through God that this is going to happen. Okay? See, it is God's wise plan for salvation of all mankind. And God's plan can be seen through a true Christian by the, the change in the Christian's life from what they were as a sinner to what they are now as a saint. And that brings me up to a subject that a lot of people say that because you belong to a church, you're a saint of God. No way. And because somebody says that you are a saint in a denomination or whatever, that doesn't mean that that person that they were calling a saint is in heaven. Because only through Jesus Christ. Not because somebody did any good works or anything, you call them a saint. No. If they never had a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, they are not in heaven at this time. Okay? Keep that in mind. So, let's go on with 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 25. It says, Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. That's from the King James Version. Now, the Good News Bible says, For what seems to be God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and what seems to be God's weakness is stronger than human strength. So, let me break that down because some people have a, a misunderstanding of what Paul is saying here. See, what it says, because the foolishness of God, which means that which God appoints requires commands and does, which appears to the people to be foolish. The things that God does in people, through people, some people see this foolishness. Oh, look at that man, uh, that person going to church every Sunday. That's stupid. Look, Sunday's my day off. I'm going to rest. I'm going to watch football. I'm going to wash my car. Okay? I have to do I have to do that. Going to church is foolishness to people. Praying is foolishness. I don't have time to waste praying. See, it's foolishness to people. Okay? To serve God seems like it's foolish. Well, I'm not going to waste my life, but remember... If you're here 50 years, 60 years, 70 years, and you never accept Christ, you had 70 years, if you're 70, to accept Christ. And if you die at 70 years old, you'll be forever, ever separated from God. Forever in torment. So what is better? To give up something for 70 years to spend an eternity in paradise? Or not to give up something in this life and to be separated from God in torment forever. It just food for thought. <coughs> so we have to understand that. Let's talk about the weakness of God. God, weak? Wow, you know, hey. Let me tell you what it says. Remember, there is really no weakness with God any more than there is folly. This means that the things he has appointed which appear weak and insufficient to accomplish the end. Which means, like, the word, hey, what do you mean everybody's going to be saved? No, it's impossible. No, it's not impossible for God. What do you mean that if you accept Christ as your Savior and Lord and are baptized and everything, that you're going to go to heaven? How could that be? Because you're going to sin. Uh, you're weak. It has nothing to do with us with our physical capabilities because there are people that are lost that are billionaires and millionaires there are people that are saved that are billionaires and millionaires because God blessed them so they might both be billionaires and millionaires but here's the thing what did this person do to get it compared to what this person did to get it 
God blesses the lost as he does the saved. It rains on the unjust the same as the just. I remember that. But the eternal destiny and what is going to transpire in judgment is what is going to make the difference, is what is going to separate the two. Mm -hmm. Eternity is what is going to make the difference. Okay? So, keep that in mind. It talks about it's stronger than men, which means it's able to accomplish more than what men might be able to do. God can do it in a flash. All he has to do is speak it. And it happens. Remember that. And what may take us a lifetime to accomplish, God can do it in a second. So look at what God can do compared to what man can do. We could pray for rain for a month. Like here in Texas, we, we haven't had a lot of rain. God can send enough rain in one day to replenish the whole earth if he wants to. <laughs> It doesn't take God a long time to accomplish something, okay? And it often reflects his highest plans by that which seems to men to be weak and even foolish. What do you mean you're depending on God? What do you mean you're asking God? What do you mean God this, God that? If you don't do it, it ain't going to get done. If you don't go out and work three jobs, you're never going to be rich. What are you talking about? God can rain blessings for me? God can send money to me. He can do anything he wants to do. I'm just using money. He can give me a new house. He can do anything he wants. He can heal me. He can keep me strong. He can have me live to be 100 years old. If that's his desire. Mm -hmm. But the men say, oh, the records say that 70 years old is it. You know, you're going to die or 72. That's your Lifespan. That's how we figure out insurance policies. That's how we figure out Social Security. And, you know, yeah, and they balance it all out to where, hey, you're going to die, and some people are going to die this age, so we'll get this money. We'll have that money. We don't have to pay. We don't have to pay that. Life is an estimation. But God has life in the palm of his hand. Yeah. <laughs> and he's the one that dictates. Yeah. If he says, I want your home, Pastor, tomorrow, I'm coming home. Whatever he wants. But he wants to happen. It's going to happen. That's why we put our total faith and trust in God through Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Remember that God is great. And if his feeblest powers put forth surpass the mightiest powers of man, how great must he be? <clears throat> Let me say this. That some people they look at God as some cosmic element. And that has transpired through different religions. It especially has become prominent in the last decade, and now in this decade here, through what we call the New Age Movement. That you are a element of the universe. You control the universe. You are a god. God is in every tree. God, hug a tree. I mean, go on a mountain, you know. And, and they have seduced the church to believe that they are some cosmic power. They are in control of their own destiny. And let me tell you this. Those of you that practice yoga and oneness and all that, you're going in the wrong direction. You, you practice this for your exercise and this and that. You're going in the wrong direction because the only one that can give you strength, give you help, keep you living is God. Not some cosmic power, not meditation and becoming one and all this power business. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. Your body is a temple for the Holy Spirit to dwell in, and you are not to defile it with the things of this world, with the humanism of this world. Get away from that transcendental and dental meditation and everything else. It is nonsense. And God is laughing at your folly and all those that live that kind of a lifestyle and believe that kind of a lie. 
Whenever you put anything before God, you are in what we call sin. God says, for I am the Lord thy God, that shall not have any strange gods before me. Whether it's you yourself, or someone else, or some statue, or some idol, or, or anything else. You are in error of the first commandment of God. Amen. I just had to add that in. Okay? Remember that. And don't think that God is some weak thing. That you can tell God what to do or you have power over God. It doesn't work. People have this attitude that if they want it, they have the right to just go get it. This is the, the teaching that is going out into the world today. And where does this teaching stem from? The stupidity of the teaching of evolution over creationism. People don't understand that evolution takes away your right because there is no creator in evolution. It just evolved. And you are nothing but something that is to be overcome by something greater and from a greater strength. You want to see things? What happens when people uh, put forth evolution? Go into the jungle. What is the, in the jungle? Who survives in the jungle? The fittest, the strongest. And remember, that strongest one day gets old and gets weak. And is devoured by someone else. So you want to believe in evolution? If anybody wants, if you work in the mass of fortune, a home and a car, if anybody else bigger than you comes in, takes it, that's part of your belief in evolution. It's all one, which means you have no rights. Only the strongest survive. But with God as the power, and you seeking him as the ultimate power, he's the one that endows you with the power, endows you with the, the, the mindset, and endows you with the wisdom, knowledge, and understanding that it takes to accomplish his will for you in this life, not your own. Remember, you are, if you are a Christian, you are bought with a price. Yes. Therefore, you glorify God in all things. So, don't ever think that you are something other than what you are not. So let's go with our main verse, and then we'll close out. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26. It says, For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. That's for the King James Version. And then from the uh, God's Word Version, it says, Brothers and sisters, that's why I put this in here, because it tells you who Paul is talking to. Mm -hmm. Us, the body of Christ. See, because a lot of people don't understand the word brethren that, I met, that is used in the King James Version. Okay? So, I wanted to put the God's Word Version where it says brothers and sisters. That means you can only be a brother and sister in, in the church if Christ is your Savior and Lord. So, Paul is talking to those that are saved. Okay? So, let me read that in God's Word Version. Brothers and sisters, consider what you were when God called you to be Christians. See, it says something more explanatory. When God called you to be Christians, that's how he can call them brothers and sisters. He is talking to Christians, okay? Not many of you were wise from a human point of view, which means you didn't have this wisdom. Not even in a human format, okay? You were not in powerful positions or in the upper social class. A lot of them were slaves. They were slaves of the Roman Empire. Okay? So I wanted to bring that to you and just explain that a, a little bit. So let's move on. For it says, for you see your calling. 
That means you know the general character and condition of those who are Christians among you. That they have not been generally taken from the wise, from the rich, and the learned, but from a humble life. God calls the least of these. And he sends us to the least of those to minister the gospel. See, the, the design of the apostle here is to show that the gospel did not depend on the success of human wisdom. Now here he's human wisdom. So we know talking about wisdom, here we're going back to the who? To the Greeks, or the Gentiles. His argument is that, in fact, those who were blessed by it had not been of the elevated ranks of society, mainly, but that God has shown his power by choosing those who are ignorant and vicious and abandoned and by reforming and purifying their lives. And so anyway, look at Paul, persecuted Christians. Look at Peter, a brawly, hot-tempered, hot Fishermen, uneducated. Look the rest of them. Now, when you get to like Matthew, he was somewhat educated. He was a tax collector. See? And Luke, who was a servant, he wasn't an apostle. He was a servant, he was a doctor. So you see one, like Luke, Dr. Luke, who was of any high standard in society. Now, Paul, yes, he was high in society, but his mindset was one of religious nature. Mm -hmm. And that's why he persecuted the church. But on the road to Damascus, God grabbed him. Mm -hmm. Christ said to him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he automatically knew at that point. Because Paul was a spiritual man, understand. But he was following religion instead of following Christ. So Paul understood right then. Yes, Lord. <laughs> there we go. He knew. Okay. Paul wasn't dumb. So, when it speaks of <clears throat> not many wise men. There's not many who are regarding us to be wise or have any education in philosophy. Okay, remember we're dealing with the Greeks here, okay? So, they were humble people. Some of them were, yeah, were high in society. And they got saved. Okay, who was one of them? Lydia. The woman in purple. Okay. Now, the other one, the one that got saved, was the Philippian jailer. So you know he had some pool. He was he wasn't just some little old guy to have a job in the prison and watch over the prisoners. He was a respectable person. But yet his life was cheap, wasn't it? Because if the prisoners would have escaped, he would have been killed himself. So being in a high position didn't mean that you were secure in any way, from any oppression from the government. No. You could have given your life. It's just like the cupbearer for the king. He had a high position, didn't he? Mm -hmm. But what? He had to drink of the, of the wine, whatever it was, let's say it's wine, first. And if it was poison, then he would die first. Mm -hmm. Okay? So keep that in mind, okay? So, so here we see, this supposes that there were some of that description. Though the mass of Christians were then and now from more humble ranks of life. What are we saying? Some of them that get saved are criminals, they were murderers, they were thieves, they were drug addicts, alcoholics. They get saved. God can save anybody. Amen. Don't let somebody's status in life fool you. Anybody can be saved. Okay, keep that in mind. So, now, there were some high, that were high in rank and wealth at Corinth who became Christians. And it's well known, like Crispus and 
Sosthenes, they were rulers of the synagogue there. And that is in Acts chapter 28. Okay? And Gaius, we know Gaius, he was a rich hospital man. And he was, and that's in Romans 16 and 23. Then there was Erastus, the chancellor of the city in Corinth. That's Romans 16 and 23. So they had been converted and were members of the church in Corinth. So I suppose that this should be rendered not many mighty or wise, etc. But the way it's written is the way we accept it, okay? See, God has not employed the wise and the learned to call you into his kingdom. God has called even the least to present the gospel to you mm -hmm. on a level where you will understand mm -hmm. and accept Christ into the kingdom. Okay? When I got saved, I was just a, a regular guy. Yeah, I had my college education, but not anything in theology until I got saved. But God sent me to the class of people that I worked with, that I could uh, communicate with. And then he sent me into the mission fields. So, remember that God has a special area of calling for everybody. Okay? And when you say, here, my Lord, send me, like Isaiah did in chapter, Isaiah chapter 6, he'll send you to where he wants you to be. So be open to the calling of God. So it says, not many mighty, I mean, not many people of power, or men sustaining important offices in the state or in, in a government. It's like we say here, anybody can become president. But that's true. Anybody can become president. But he has to be able to have a relationship with the people that are supporting him. Now, when it says not many noble, that means not many of illustrious birth. You know, like king, the, 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 the sons or daughters of kings and queens and things like that, okay? Or of mayors or senators or generals in the army or anything like that. See, in respect to each of these classes, the apostle does not say that there were no men of wealth, power, or birth. He didn't say that. But that the mass or body of Christians was composed of such. That they were made up of those who were humble and light. Just the, nor the normal, ordinary people. That's why the Bible was written to people where they will understand. And it should be always presented to people in, in a mannerism where they will understand. So when you speak to people, speak to them in, in ways and use words that they understand. Don't try to impress that, that you are theologically educated or you have this great mindset. Speak to people where they will understand. Okay? So, in closing, beloved, as you can see, the calling of God in a person's life is what raises people to different positions in the world. It is God who qualifies man and his purpose and not earthly rulers or their manners. God is the one that elevates people. God is the one that causes kingdoms to rise and kingdoms to fall. God sets kings and rulers and princes and presidents and dictate. He sets everyone in place because he has a plan and a purpose. Okay? Now, a lot of people, let me just say this in closing. We had a Second World War, and a lot of people thought that it was so harsh of what God allowed to happen to the Jews. But through that, I mean, I'm not condoning any of that. It was wrong. Hitler was a murderer. It was a beast. But through all that, God blessed the Jewish people with their own country. 
and is now one of the most powerful countries in the world Amen. for Amen. its size. And that's where we're going to be going Amen. the end of the month. But know that God had a plan and a purpose. And although we don't see God's plan and purpose now, because we look through a glass that was shadowy, smoky, we call it, okay? We don't see it. But in time, God will reveal his plan. And only a few short years from the end of the war to 1948, that's all it took, a couple of years, and Israel was established as a nation and went back to Palestine. And now Palestine is Israel. So they have their own land. And God has blessed them. And that's why we need to continue to pray for them. And I know that they're praying for us. And let us do God's will. Let us pray for our country, who is in turmoil right now. Let us pray for our leaders. Let us pray that God give them the wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, understanding that they need. And let us pray that God give people the desire to pray and to lift up our country and our leaders. Ask God to bless America. And let's pray for every American to bless God. Amen? Amen. So remember that God through Christ perfects man. And no one else can perfect man but God through his son Jesus Christ. And you can only be perfected when you come to Christ as your Savior and Lord. So always remember who you are in Christ and who empowers you. But the thing is, through all this message, we come down to the nitty-gritty of the message. It's that the calling of God perfects man. You cannot do it on your own. You need Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord. And if you have never accepted Christ as your Savior and Lord, I want to give you the opportunity to do so today. I want to pray with you. See, because John 3, 16 said, For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever shall believe in Him shall not perish, but shall have everlasting life. And Paul, in Romans 10, 9 and 10, says, that If thou shalt confess the Lord Jesus Christ, and believe in our heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, that shalt be saved. So, beloved, the opportunity is here for you to receive power, wisdom, and knowledge from God. But that's not the main reason. The main reason is that you receive salvation, eternal life in heaven through Jesus Christ by proclaiming Him as your Savior and Lord, by turning from your sin, by repenting from your sin. Would you like to do that today? I know there are some of you that would like to do it. So if you, if you would, would you like to pray? I'm going to pray, and I want you to pray with me, but mean it. Don't worry about who is around you or who, what, or what. If you want to, just get on, just pray there quietly. This is an eternal prayer, because this prayer determines where you will spend eternity. Let us pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ, I heard the message today, the calling of God perfects man. And I believe God is calling me today to perfect me, to endow me with salvation. And I understand that that only comes from accepting His Son, Jesus Christ, as my Savior and Lord. It only comes through repenting from all my sins. And I want to do that today. I ask that you forgive me of my sins and cleanse me of all righteousness, for I am sorry for my sins. I want to turn from my sins. I want to be a Christian. I want to accept Jesus Christ as my Savior and Lord and follow Him only. Because I have tried the ways of the world and I have failed. And now I want to Accept Jesus Christ as my Savior and Lord. I want to repent of all my sins. And I ask you to forgive me of my sins, Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ. Wash me and cleanse me 
of my sins. Make me new. Live within me through your Holy Spirit. I believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross at Calvary, that he was raised from the dead on the third day and ascended in heaven, is now sitting at your right hand in a place of power and majesty for where he shall come to judge the dead and the living. I believe that today. And I accept that as being fact. And I accept Jesus Christ as my Savior and Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Beloved, if you said that prayer, let me be the first to welcome you into the kingdom of God. Now what I want you to do is go to a Bible preaching, teaching church. Get an audience with the pastor. Tell him what you did. Ask him to pray with you again. Ask him to anoint you with oil. Ask him to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And ask him to disciple you and to give you a Bible. And what else I also want you to do is contact me by email at abundant.grace at att.net. I'm Bishop Ramon Di Maria. I'm the pastor of Abundant Grace Church. Please contact me. If you need help or you need direction, Please contact me. If you need a church, please contact me. There are many churches in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, but I don't know what part of the world you are in. But please contact me. Let me hear from you. You can tune into our broadcast on PirateRadio.com under Gospel and Abundant Grace Church, on Ustream.tv under Victory in Christ, on YouTube. Under my name, Bishop Ramon Di Maria. You can contact us through our website at www.abundantgracechurch.net or through our other website at www.abundantgraceofmelothian.com. There are many ways to contact us, but the easiest way is through email at abundant.grace at att.net. I'll be waiting to hear from you. Thank you for watching us today. I'm Bishop Ramon Di Maria. I'm pastor of Abundant Grace Church. And you are watching our video broadcast. Don't forget, contact me. God bless you, my beloved, and go with God.